did you feel personally when you heard that she was leaving? Were you surprised? Were you delighted? Um, I was surprised. Um, however, you know, I, I think leadership does take its toll eventually um, on everybody, and that's regardless um, of um, you know political party or political persuasion. Um, so, you know, I think everyone naturally comes to the decision where um, they no longer feel that they're able to continue on in that role. You found like, you sound like you've got a bit of sympathy for her, Megan. No, I mean not sim well, not sympathy. I think I sympathise from her, you know, in terms of you know being a, a woman uh, MSP and Nicola Sturgeon being the mm. first female first minister. Um, so I do have some uh, sympathies there. But in terms of her record um, and her time in, in office as first minister, then no, sorry, I don't because her, her record is appalling. This is the irony, though, isn't it, Megan? For people like us who want to see more women wielding more influence, having a a powerful role in politics. It is quite heartbreaking when someone who's done a, 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 been in that position for so long, whether you agree with their politics or not, which neither of us do, I think it is, it is, there is, a, there is a, a tinge of sadness that she hasn't managed to last the distance. However, how ironic that what probably did for her was her gender ideology in which she seemed to always put forward, not seem to, she categorically couldn't answer what a biological woman was. It would have been so easy, wouldn't it, for her to say there are women and there are trans women, but she wouldn't make that commitment. Why not? Well, I mean, I think she backed herself into a corner um, and she failed to take into to account the concerns that women were raising, you know, right from the start of the, the process of the gender recognition reform bill. Um, you know, it eventually got to the point where um, she was refusing to call a, a violent rapist a man. Um, and you saw from the exchanges between Nicola Sturgeon and Douglas Ross at First Minister's Question that she eventually backed herself into a corner that she could no longer get herself out of. Mm. Now, of course, one consequence of this is that uh, Scottish politicians' media offices have had to dust their phones off and start taking calls from the likes of me wanting to hear from all you have to say. One upside of this is that as we run into the next general election, everyone is going to be very interested in what's happening north of the border. Well, definitely. I think all eyes are on Scotland now um, and what's going to happen um, and who's going to succeed um, Nicola Sturgeon. Of course, it's going to come as no surprise um, that I don't have um, a preferred candidate. Um, it's the, the job of the, the official opposition, the second largest party in Scotland, the Scottish Conservatives, to make sure that we can get rid of the SNP government come the next election. And of course, when it comes to the general election, that we're winning more seats here north of the border. Now, of course, the people who are celebrating this morning are the Scottish Labour Party. They are seeing this as a victory for them. They won one seat up north in the last election. But today they're saying that they think they're going to get 25. What's your response to that? I mean, I think I think they're being um, a little bit um, preemptive of, of the result. To be honest, I mean, we are the second largest party in Scotland, um, and I think it's the Scottish Conservatives who are most likely to benefit from the fallen support of the SNP from the, the last general election. Um, you know, across rural Scotland, for example, um, there's a number of tight constituency seats um, that we are planning to fight um, for in the upcoming general election. Mm. Labour, on the other hand. I mean, they've got one MP, as you say, and, you know, looking across Scotland, I think there's very few um, obvious seats that come to mind where they can target. Um, and the fact is, you know, the most marginal seats um, are between us and the SNP. So I think that's where the fight's going to be. We've seen what happens when there is a leadership battle down here in Westminster. We've had enough of them, Megan, frankly, for the last 12 months. But what it does is it focuses a lot of attention on that particular political party. This is what the SNP are now going to be dealing with. They've got their uh, conference, I believe, next month, if they're still going ahead with that, with, with Nicola Sturgeon as the leader uh, in, in waiting, effectively, a kind of de facto leader for the time being. Um, how will you, as the Scottish Conservatives, um, push back against all of the attention that they're about to get? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we're going to focus on, you know, things that matter to the people of Scotland. Um, the SNP are a one-trick pony, as we see time and time again. Um, you know, the special conference, again, was to focus on a de facto independence referendum. We actually want to see a Scotland and a, a Scottish government that focuses on things like housing, like our NHS, like our education system. They're the things that people want to speak about when we get to the doorstep, and they're not getting that from the SNP. So we're going to offer the real alternative that Scotland needs, and that's what we're focusing on just now. And that's what we are planning um, on the route up to our own party conference, which will happen um, in the spring.
Now, whoever becomes the next leader of the SNP, uh, be it John Sweeney, Angus Robertson, Kate Forbes, will they come out swinging for another independence referendum or would that be a, a political suicide for them? I mean, I think we'll need to wait and see. I mean, there doesn't seem to be, you know, as, as we say, you know, necessarily a, a front runner um, as it stands. And I think we'll need to see who the, the runners and riders as they emerge um, and what their, their vision is um, before we can we can um, look to see what their um, their plan is. And mm. no doubt it will have something to do with independence. Let's face it. Um, nationalism uh, is, is their, you know, their, their, their bread and butter. Um, however, you know, I, I don't want to see that from any candidate. What I would like to see is for once the, the Scottish Government focus on what matters. Um, I don't want to see any more arguments over another independence referendum. You know, that argument is well settled. The people of Scotland do not want another independence referendum. And I think the, the next party leader and first minister um, of the SNP and indeed Scotland, that's what their focus needs to be on. It needs to be on the people of Scotland, not this, you know, nonsense of a, another referendum.